Good evening, Pear Orchard. Welcome to Evening Worship. We're glad that you have joined us online, and we hope that God's Word uh, and the songs that we sing, the prayers that we pray, uh, would encourage your hearts this evening. I hear the Lord call us to worship from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's sing together. Love divine, all loves excelling. pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we do long that you finish the work that you have begun in us. We feel that great gap in our hearts and, and we long to obey you as we should. Yet we know that we struggle to walk in your ways. We, we desire to hate sin more and to love what you love more. Father, we praise you that through Jesus Christ, you will deliver us from the body of death. And it is to you that we lift up our voices this evening. It is to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that we draw near to. We ask that you would reveal to us more of your steadfast love. Show us that love which surpasses all things. Help us, Holy Spirit, to worship the triune God this evening. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. If you would look at your bulletin as we 
will confess our faith this evening. We'll be using the shorter catechism, question number 82, and uh, two verses coming from Romans 3.23 and Ecclesiastes 7.20. Christian, is any man able to perfectly keep the commandments of God? No mere man since the fall is able in this life perfectly to keep the commandments of God, but does daily break them in thought, word, and deed. How are we taught this truth in Romans 3.23? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How are we taught this truth in Ecclesiastes 7.20? Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Let us uh, go on to sing our next song, I Have Been Crucified with Christ. If you would, open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, we are continuing our evening scripture reading through the gospel of Mark. And as you're turning there, let me tell you a story that I think might help uh, illustrate what this text is going to be talking about. There was one evening where I was probably about uh, earlier high school age, and I was outside, and and I saw one of my friends try to run and get into a car. And as he was trying to get into the car, he slipped and fell and smashed his head on, on the pavement. And so naturally, we called for the paramedics as there was a lot of blood on this guy's head and coming out of him. And, and it was interesting, when the paramedics got there, they initially looked at him and they said, we think that his earlobe is bleeding. Well, my dad, who is a veterinarian, uh, and he knew a little bit about what was going on, he looked and he said, there's no way that this much blood could be coming out of merely the earlobe. And so my dad was saying that actually the correct diagnosis was not an earlobe bleed, but an internal bleed. You see, where there was no true diagnosis for my friend, there would not have been hope for my friend. And we see this in scriptures, that where there's no true diagnosis of us, there is no true hope. And Jesus, he's seeking to give us a true diagnosis, not to, to leave us without hope, but to help us run to the right destination. 
as he talks about the true diagnosis and showing that it's not the things outside of us that defile us, but the things inside of us, he then shows us that we can actually run to him and find that new creation life that we long for. So let's read Mark chapter 7, that that whole chapter. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And Jesus said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. And he called the the people to him again, and he said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that... Whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but, his, but it's his stomach and is expelled. Thus, he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. And from there he arose and went away into the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately... A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And Jesus said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And Jesus said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting his tongue, and looked up to heaven, and he sighed. And he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue 
was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. What a great text. A text that reminds us that we can run to Jesus no matter where we come from. And what a truth that sends us into the singing of our next song as we sing Psalm 32. singing what a beautiful psalm reminding us of the forgiveness that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ through faith alone and of the work of holiness that the Spirit of God is working in our hearts. One of the things that I miss the most about not being able to gather together with you the people of God uh, in corporate worship is this time that we're about to enter into a time of prayer. We're so used to being able to pray for and with one another corporately together out loud uh, and we aren't able to do that uh, but I do want to encourage you, if there are things that you uh, would like your entire uh, family to be praying for, family of God, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, please do uh, email. Uh, Laura Herbison runs our prayer email, and that email address is pray at prayatpearorchard.org, P-R-A-Y, pray at prayatpearorchard.org. And uh, we would love to be able to send those prayer requests out to the congregation. If there are other prayer requests that uh, you would like uh, for us to, to pray for as, as pastors, then please do 
uh, send those directly to us uh, individually. You have our emails uh, in Shelby Next uh, on that app. Uh, but uh, before we go to prayer, before Wilson uh, leads us in prayer, I wanted to read uh, from a text message that Pastor Carl received from Harris Bond, one of our uh, missionaries that we uh, support. He is a church planner in Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, and this past week, uh, he had a, a mild heart attack, and he had two stents put in his, uh, his body and his arteries. And so I wanted to read uh, just a few things that uh, Harris uh, shared with Carl. He said, I got home yesterday, uh, being still, healing from the heart cath, adjusting to blood thinners and blood pressure. The blockages uh, were both 95 to 99 percent. And so we're very thankful uh, that the Lord uh, allowed those blockages to be caught. And then he, he writes this, so grateful to the Lord for preserving me and sending me back to fear him, love my family, and serve others with his gospel as a dying man to dying men, uh, more conscious that we love and labor while it is still day. Uh, those are great words. Thank you, Harris, for, for sharing and reminding us of the brevity of life and uh, what we do in, as Christians laboring for his kingdom. Uh, we know that we do it with a clock ticking. Uh, we I don't know our time, uh, and so we come even now in prayer, and we come to, to worship tonight to hear God's word, uh, aware uh, of the shortness of life, aware uh, that our days are numbered, uh, that God is holy, that we are sinful, that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that is our, our hope. So let's go to the Lord now in, in prayer. I was reading earlier today uh, about Thomas Goodwin, one of the famous Puritans, and he said that whenever we see someone pray for us, it should be a reminder that Jesus is praying for us. What a great reminder is that it's not merely someone up here in the pulpit who is praying, but it is a, it is a reminder that Jesus is momently praying for us. So let us go to our Father in prayer. Our holy and heavenly Father, Who's like you? Would you help us to approach you with deepest fear and yet holy confidence? Would you grant us that holy boldness that we can actually have in Christ because of what he's done for us? Father, we know that you are far beyond the grasp of our understanding. Your love is truly so infinite that our best thoughts... They'll forever fall short. You are supremely beautiful, supremely good, supremely faithful to us. Who in all the world is like you? What could we compare to you? Lord Jesus, our hearts melt when we think about your love for us. Your love is truly so magnificent that our hearts are often too quick to say it's too good to be true. Lord Jesus, we know that you are bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. You lived for us. You died for us. You rose for us. You are supremely for us. You loved us so much that you gave yourself for us. And what a marvelous mystery that is. What a marvelous mystery it is to say that we are yours, and you are ours. Our Lord, we, we confess that our perception of your love falls so short. We are too quick to think low thoughts of you. It's, it's easier for us to think that you more quickly draw away from us than you draw near to us. We often picture you shying away from us when we're in our sin rather than running after us as you ran after Jonah. It's easier to imagine your wrath than it is to imagine your grace. You tell us that you are gentle and lowly in heart, but we often relate to you as if you are rough and harsh. Would you forgive us of our wrong views of you? Would you... Please shape our hearts to be conformed to your word. Father, keep bringing us along in this, this lifelong journey of having our false views of you stripped away and you showing us who you really are. Jesus, so father-like you tend 
to us. Graciously, you spare us. You know our feeble frame and your hand so gently bears us. Rescue us from our enemies. Deliver us from our sins. Remind us of your infinite love and your gracious heart. Holy Spirit, show us the heart of Christ for us. Put the compassion of Christ on display for our unbelieving hearts. Tell us of how he is truly able to sympathize with us. Convince us that he can deal gently with our low estate. Grant us confidence that he will never cast us out. Warm our hearts at the thought that he saves even the uttermost. Jesus, thank you for being our advocate, especially when we fall into grievous sin. Thank you for coming to our aid even when all others forsake us. There is truly no one who has a more beautiful heart than you. You are the most tender friend that we could ever have. Heavenly Father, you are the Father of mercies, mercies that are new every morning. Holy Spirit, you are the giver of grace and the renewer of our conscience in Christ. You declare to us in Jeremiah that your heart yearns for us. And what, what a thought. Oh, would you help us to only understand merely a fraction of that infinite love. Holy Spirit, do that miraculous work in us. Father, we do ask that you would be with the Bond family and be with Harris Bond as they are in Monroe. Would you continue to bring healing to him and would you continue to bring support to their family? Father, grow that congregation and may they show forth the love and compassion of Christ as they walk alongside the Bond family. We praise you that the procedure seems to have gone well and that he is on the, on the road to a full recovery and would you be with him and even double his fruit as he walks in weakness but in strength in you we pray also for mary helen perry who was admitted to baptist earlier this week and father we ask that you would 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 help her and would you give her better help that she would even return to ridgeland place soon we pray for Lila Strickland, who will be having her spleen removed on May 14th. Once again, we, we, ask for, we ask for wisdom and skill for the doctors and for her speedy recovery. Our Holy Father, we ask that you would bring healing and comfort to Linda Tackett and the Tackett family during this time. Father, it is difficult during this time because with such a health scare in Corona, it, it makes it difficult for us to even visit ill family members in the hospital. Father, we need patience. We need wisdom. We need, we need trust in you. And would you be with the Tackett family? Father, we pray also for Aline Allen, who has been ill recently. And once again, during this time of numerous health threats, it is so easy to get in that spiral of, of what if. So would you be with her? Would you help her to gain back her health and she, that she would recover well? Holy Father, we're asking that you would be with Dean tonight as he proclaims your word. That we would hear the voice inside of the voice. And as we hear you speak, that we would bow down in wonder. That we would run to Christ. And that we would know his heart for us. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you that we can come to the Father boldly because of what you've done for us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I'd ask that you turn in your Bible to Proverbs, the seventh chapter. <clears throat> Just going to go straight into reading this and then expounding on this particular text. This is God's word, so I'm asking that you give careful attention. Give all your focus to every jot and every tittle because it is God's word. Proverbs 7. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. 
Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend. To keep you from the forbidden women, woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, and at the time of night and darkness. And behold, a woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, cuddled linens, linens from Egyptian linen. I have performed my bed with, perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With a smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, as a stag in, is caught fast till an arrow pierces its sliver, as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O oh sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are mighty, are mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Father, we pray that as we expound on your word, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would illumine our minds, and that above all things, you would give us an affection, a new zeal, new affections for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as you continue to mold and shape us into his image, all to the praise of your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our trek through the book of Proverbs, it's most interesting to note that of the seven chapters we've covered thus far, that would be including tonight. This will be the third one that explicitly deals with the issue of adultery and the adulterer. A writer Solomon who had, interestingly enough, 700 wives and 300 concubines seems to have a very heightened sense that there is a great need to beat this proverbial drum, if you will. And he is by no means out of step with the admonitions of scripture in, in general. Not at all. In fact, adultery is one of the most frequently and severe, severely condemned sins in the Bible. It's mentioned 52 times, including in God's moral law, the Ten Commandments. It's also mentioned in 10 other books of the Bible and in all four Gospels. Only the sins of idolatry, self-righteousness, and murder are mentioned more often. And so we, we shouldn't be surprised then because the ramifications you see are so far-reaching. And so it's no wonder that the man who is said to have more wisdom, it's no wonder then that, that he, the man who walked on this face of this earth with all wisdom, more wisdom than anyone else besides our Lord Christ, that he would address this in scripture with the level of frequency he is mirroring the scriptures as a whole. And so in this particular passage in chapter 7, how does he go about doing it? He uses three steps, which we're going to look at this evening in the form of three major headings. First, he issues an appeal to guard against enticement. He then shares a story of an incident of enticement, an eyewitness account, if you will, that he saw. And then he ends by unmasking the, the consequences 
of falling for that enticement. And his goal, verse 5, to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth, that is the enticing words, to keep him from the same pit, if you will, that his grandfather David fell into, and later I'm going to argue that he himself, Solomon, fell uh, into. So with all that being said, let's look at our text more closely. Let's start with the father's appeal, if you will. Solomon begins his moment of, of fatherly admonishment in much the same way he has before. He encourages his son to pay close attention to him, to place a high degree of worth on that which he's hearing, to esteem it as being as close to him as a, a dear, a nuclear family member, as a close and most trustworthy friend. The word command here is the same word that is often used when God speaks of God's commands, when we see the word God's commands. So the authority of God in, in the covenant and the authority of a parent as a teacher of wisdom are joined together here. And so the son, and then the son is directed to write these instructions on his heart. It's the same manner in which God has stated that he in Jeremiah 31, 33, that he would write his words, his commandments, his tablet on the tablets of our hearts, rather. You see, Solomon is not simply concerned with the external, with external compliances, but he wants his word to be engrafted, to be grafted into his son's heart so that it might manifest itself in, in, in his personality and his character. Many of us exhibited, if you will, great external forms of obedience. In fact, many people go to church today and externally, they seem to be obeying God. They seem to be doing certain things. But then when they get on their own, the word that best fit their character and personality when they step out the church, when children leave the home and, and go off to college, the word that fit their character and personality is buck wild. And so... As we listen to these words this evening, what I'm going to say to you right up front is that we need to have, as we look at this passage, we need to have a, a made-up mind concerning how we're going to respond to what we're being asked. And what are we being asked, you, you, you ask again? Well, let, let me give you a New Testament version of what Solomon is doing with his son here, speaking to his son. Listen to Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Listen, it can rightly be said that when a person entertains a thing, when they happily allow it to invade the depths of their personhood, they do so because they find that thing to be delightful. Think of Psalm 1. After the psalmist says, don't walk, in the counsel of the ungodly, don't, don't, don't stand in the way of the sinner and don't sit in the seat of the mocker. He goes on to say what? But that person, that person who is blessed, their delight, hear that word, their delight is in the law of the Lord, his word. And in it they meditate day and night. It is their strong tower. It is his or her strong tower. And thus it becomes that which guards him or her. And is that that is Solomon is after here with his son. Let your affection for the word be greater than everything else. And in this case, let it be greater than the enticement of the adulterous woman. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it marinate. Let it keep you. And so in an effort to drive home what he's saying... He resorts to sharing a story which takes us to our second point. It's a sad story. It's an eyewitness account of an incident, if you will, of enticement. And in this story, there are two main characters. First, there's a young man. We find him first in verse 6. And here he's described as one lacking sense. That is the key characteristic that you find in this young man. So opposite of what Solomon is asking his son to do, to be filled with the word of God, to be filled with wisdom, here is a person who is opposite of that. And you would expect that Solomon would indeed 
use such a person to point out exactly what he's saying to his son. So I looked up this lack in sense. And the word, the synonym that came up was a simpleton. An ignorant person. Ignorant means you don't have any knowledge. Indeed, a person lacking wisdom. And because he was empty-headed, because he lacked sense, because he lacked wisdom, because his natural inclination, just like every one of us, is that of a sinner, he unknowingly or knowingly chose the wrong direction, the way to her house, the path of adultery, the path of sin. And it was all so dark. Isn't it interesting how these things always take place undercover? You don't ever see these folks acting out in the light because sin loves the cover of darkness. And so she comes out, and she comes out after him. But, and look now, and he's taken in by what? The externals. If you look at verse 16, here's how she gets them. She says, I have spread my couch with coverings, cut a linens from my Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. He's hooked by his eyes, his flesh, and the pride of life. She uh, appeals to his pride. I've been looking for you. And guess what? She's lying. She hasn't been looking for him. She's been looking for anyone that's silly, anyone whose head is empty, anyone who she can get to use for her own purposes. And look who he's hanging around with. Look at verse 7. Look who he's hanging around with. He's a young man lacking sense. And who is he hanging around with? A bunch of other people I have seen among the simple. He's among who? The simple. A bunch of other folks who has no sense. The Bible says that in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You are to walk with people who are godly, people who have wisdom, people who can teach you. Don't walk around with ungodly people. Don't walk around with people who head, whose heads are empty. Because if you don't believe something, you will believe anything. And so surround yourself with people of God who can lead you in the right path. So here you have this young man who's simple, who's lacking sense, and he goes down the wrong path to her house. He's lured away down the wrong street, and then he comes to her, and that's our second character, this woman. She's described as a, a wily person, and that word wily means cunningly deceptive. As I said, she already lied to him when she talked about all that stuff. And she lies here and says she needs money to pay her offering. You can find that in, in verse 14. Here the text is uh, poorly translated from the Hebrew. It should say, I have to pay my vows. The fact that she says to her husband, uh, that he has, says about her husband that he has taken the bag of money with him, uh, the implication being that she is therefore in need of money validates the reading, this reading of the text. So she's out there prostituting herself. She's loud. She's haughty. She, there's no sign of modesty in her. She's flashy in the way she goes about things. And this brother, because he's empty of God's wisdom, because he's empty, because he's simple, because he lacks knowledge, the knowledge that Solomon is asking his son, asking us, to fill ourselves with God's word, to walk in the light of God's word. Because he does not have those things, he falls for her. We're told she lacks any inkling of modesty, I said. She's even the one who initiates physical contact, seizing and, and kissing the man. So the means, the motive, and the opportunity, her husband are away. Now these are all aspects of facets uh, in order to have a crime. All are communicated here, all the elements necessary for this crime, the, the crime of infidelity, of covenant, of covenant destruction. And speaking of her husband, here's how she's messing with his mind. What kind of, she says, oh, my husband is away and, and he's on a long journey, so now he plays in his mind because he's twisting his mind and making up things. What kind of husband would leave her broke, leave her husband broke? Go on a long journey without taking care of her. What kind of husband? Oh, you know, so maybe I should give her this money. Maybe I should spend time with her. And, but she's lying, lying, lying as sin always lies to people. 
And look, I'm looking in the camera here. Ladies, look at me closely or maybe listen to me closely. If you've been on a job or somewhere else talking to a man or men you find verbally or maybe physically pleasing to the eye and you start talking negatively about your husband to that man and you feel good when you're talking negatively about your husband to that man. Listen to me. You, like this young man, you are on the wrong street. You are not on memory, memory lane. You are on adultery way, which is located right next to Big Trouble Boulevard. You need to get off that street immediately. And, and guess what? The pandemic has given you an opportunity to repent and reset. You have been taken away from a whole bunch of things. Many of us, by the way, when I get to the end of this and I start talking about how New Testament Christians should look at this, you will see that, that we have been given an opportunity to repent and reset. So here, again, this woman takes him in and he now falls for her, okay? He falls head over heels. He's gone. When we look at the, the, the verse, it says, 21, it says, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. And then it says, all at once, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. The liver is commonly referred to, brothers and sisters, as the seat of life. So this is a mortal blow that she deals to this young man. She messes up his quality of life. She messes up every aspect of his life. He's taken down and it's done suddenly. When he says peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction. He does not know that it will cost him his life. He is ignorant of this fact. Listen. Even though God will forgive adultery, even though God will forgive different types of sin, more often than not, the damage that it leaves behind cannot be undone. If Solomon's father, David, were able to speak to us now, he would testify to that fact. He would say that we can't get Uriah back. He would say we can't get the child that, was, that died as a result of the punishment. He would say that the sword that was in the house constantly and did not depart because of what was done cannot be reversed and again that's why Solomon might be beating this proverbial drum because he lived in a household where he saw the fruits of adultery for his life adultery is extremely hurtful to the spouse it often leads to divorce and and leaves the marriage partners embittered disillusioned and financially poor. It robs the children of the love and security of a healthy family and denies them a good role model for their own future marriages. Children from families where there's conflict and, and or divorce are, are more prone to anxiety, poor school performance, drug abuse, and delinquent behavior. These problems can persist into adulthood. Adult children of divorced parents as a result of adultery and other factors tend to have lower educational attainment, lower income, more children out of wedlock. They themselves experience a higher rate of, of divorce and a lower sense of, of well-being. All these maladies are a fruit from the poisonous tree of adultery, brothers and sisters. All of them. And so Solomon says, oh now in verse 24, oh sons. Sons is plural. Now he's not just speaking to the simpleton. He's speaking to all. He's saying even the wise is prone to fall. Listen to me, oh sons, listen. And be attentive to the word of my mouth. This is his third and final appeal. 
This is the third section of what he's doing. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't be fooled by this. Do not stray into her past. For many of victims has she laid low. I just told you of all the different consequences, all the different ramifications, and, and those are just a few of the things that happen. Our entire society, we can say, has been destroyed by adultery. We are a sex-crazed society. I, I would say even now, when the, on the political front, one of the things, the key things that even the, the, the demarcation is built around sex. Think about that. And again, people are getting destroyed. Commercials are hiding the fact that venereal diseases, AIDS, and everything else in the way it's destroying life. All this stuff is going on, and, and again, it's under the cover of what? Darkness. Remember, she operates under the cover of darkness. So many of victims she has laid down, laid low, and her slain are a mighty throng. Just look all around you, and you'll see. Her house is the way to shield, going down to the chambers of death. 1 Corinthians 6 says, do not be deceived. And it lays out a whole bunch of people, and it says one of them is the adulterer will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Here's two words. Let me tell you something. Here's two words that I've, I've learned to ask myself. And, and, and I'm going to go a little bit further because remember I said that it's more than just physical adultery. But here's two words that I've learned how to ask myself. These two words. Question. Then what? Every sin faced with, every temptation faced with, if I do that, then what? And step back and ask that question and think through those things and then answer, see what the answer is. Now I want to transition a little bit here. We've unmasked the consequences of falling for that enticement. That's 21 through 27. But here's what I want to say to you. When we look at this text, through the grid of redemptive history, that is when we think of the fact that God in eternity past, the Father, promised the Son a people for himself. Those people are referred to as his bride. And then when we think of the fact that creation came about, then there was a fall. And now there's redemption. And then there's consummation. Those are the four prongs, if you will, to redemptive history. So God created us. We fell. And again, from before the foundations of the world, he already knew that he was going to have a people for himself. And he entered into a covenant with those people. And so now you think about it. Marriage was the very first institution that was placed in the earth. Then you get to the book of Ephesians and we find out that marriage is a representation of Christ, the husband, and the church, the bride. Then we move back into the Old Testament and we visit Hosea, for instance, and we look at the second chapter of Hosea and we hear God speaking to Hosea and telling him to get married to a harlot because he wants a demonstration of the fact that God's people were in adultery, were adulterous, were breaking covenant with him. And so we understand that there's a spiritual implication that we are God's people. And we also can be simpletons. We also can be tempted by that wayward woman. Her name in our situation is called sin. In Genesis 4. When Cain cut the food, God went to him and God said, hey, what's the problem? If you do what is right, you know what was right? What is acceptable in God's sight? Listening to God's word, obeying God, walking with God. He said, if you do what's right, things will go well with you. But if you don't, sin is crouching at the door. And I like the, new, the King James uh, version that says, and its desire is for you. 
And sin will come in all sorts of deceptive forms. This is not something new. This is what happens in the very beginning. Eve was what? Deceived. Eve was appealed to by her eyes. She saw something that looked good because Satan deceived her. Then she tasted it, and guess what? I bet you that fruit tasted real good. Because you see, sin does feel good for a season. But when it conceives, I bet you if Eve was here now, and she said, man, she would have been saying the same thing Jesus said. Is there any other way to do this? Is there any other way to do this? Because now I see all, I am Eve, the mother of all living, and I see all living suffering. I see all living dying. I see the ravages of sin, and I don't like what I see. I was deceived the same way this young man was deceived. And so we are tempted. Then Satan tried to do the same thing to our Lord in Matthew 4. The difference is our Lord had the word richly dwelling in him. He was filled with the spirit without bounds. And so how did he respond? With the word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. The word of God was dwelling richly in him. And that's what Solomon is saying to us. Let the word of God dwell richly in us. Now there's one other thing that I want to say here. Because there's also a danger when you start reading from week to week in Old Testament passages and you start hearing, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. There is a danger that you enter into what's called the moralism zone. That is all of a sudden you start putting up lists of don't do this and don't do this and don't do that. And your focus becomes that list. There is a name for that. It's called legalism. Okay? Let me suggest to you that we are not supposed to place our focus on what not to do. But what we're supposed to do is place our focus on the object of our affections, Jesus Christ. It is when you grow in your affection for Jesus that your affections for other things fall away. It is when you grow in your knowledge of your own sin and the greatness and the grandeur of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit's grace. It is when you grow in that knowledge. It is when you gravitate towards Christ and you start loving him and holding dear to him that the rest of those things fall away. That is how you break free from those things, not by looking at it. If Eve had turned away from the tree, even though it looked good, but she turned around and saw the goodness of God, and she understand that he created all things, including her, and gave her the opportunity to do all things, except that one little stupid thing. If she had recognized the grandeur of her Lord, if she had walked in that and focused on that, nothing else would have mattered. That tree would have meant nothing to her. What Satan would have said to her would have meant nothing. But instead, we're deceived, made to be taken down that wrong road over and over and over again. So once again, remember I mentioned the fact that this pandemic a lot of us, in terms of adulterous relationships, we've been dragged down the road of placing sports higher than our God. We've been dragged down the road of all sorts of stuff. It, this thing is very deceptive. You got preachers that have been dragged down the road of numbers and walking in pride because they have numbers or anything else. You have people that have been dragged down the road and because of the money that they have. And now their portfolios are suffering. You have people that's been, you know what your God has been. You know what you've been deceived into taking as your God, as that which has gotten your affections. You know what that thing is. And this pandemic has struck at the heart of it and given you an opportunity to get off Bad Road Boulevard. And now get on the road to faithful and true. To get on the same road that Christian went in the Pilgrim's Progress. 
head on down, ease on down the road. I think that was Wizard of Oz. The point being, all of us are prone to being deceived in the same manner this young man was deceived. All of us are prone to going astray. We need the power of the Spirit of God in us. We need to turn our eyes and our focus to him. Keep it on him. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in us. Avail ourselves of every means of grace available to us. When the doors of the church open, run to it. Run to your fellow believers. Hold fast to those who are filled with knowledge, with wisdom. Continue to show the awesome and beautiful spirit that you have been exhibiting as a church. And may the God of heaven walk with us and keep us from the path of adultery as we walk down the path of faithfulness, submitting to him and him alone. Let's pray. Father, we, as we look at this young man in this particular passage, it would be so easy for us to say, yeah, see, that's him, and look at ourselves as having all wisdom, all knowledge, and, and fortified against falling to so many things. But the reality of the situation is I, I would venture to say that each and every one of us, at so many various times in our lives and in our day, are prone to fall in and have fallen. We thank you that your word tells us that the righteous falls seven times and gets back up. Because of your faithfulness, your commitment to us, you are carrying us along. You are finishing that which you started in us until the day of our Lord. But Father, would you have it so that we would submit ourselves to you that our eyes would be open to the works of the enemy, that our discernment would be sharpened so that we can see when we're heading down the wrong path, so that we can step back and say and ask, what then? And be able to come up with the right words as informed by your word. Guide us according to the dictates of your word. Remove us from the dictates of our own fallen hearts. Do all to the praise of your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us respond to God's word, if you will, singing, Jesus, sinners doth receive.
I trust that each and every one of you have had an awesome Lord's Day. May that continue into this week as you keep your focus on Christ and the path that he has set for you from before the foundations of the world. Receive now the Lord's benediction. Now may the Savior who died and rose and reigns, may he grant you joy in the midst of labor, peace in the midst of troubles, Hope in the midst of despair and faithfulness in the midst of temptation. He is faithful and delights in keeping us. So take heart in him. Go in peace. Amen.